Welcome everyone to the webinar on understanding text recycling. Uh, we have um, a very large number of people who are enrolled for this particular um, session, which I think tells us all how important this is uh, in many of our working lives dealing with, uh, with text recycling. So welcome. We're delighted to have three speakers from the Text Recycling Research Project, Carrie Moskowitz, Michael Pemberton, and David Hansen. Now, some of you, if you are, um, are you participating from Europe, may have had the opportunity to hear these gentlemen at our last European seminar that was late September in 2019. Um, it was a terrific session and we got really positive feedback and it was clear that everyone was very engaged. So that, that made us want to do this again and want to invite them. And, and we're very glad that they're gracious enough to be, be with us today. With that, uh, I'd like to ask our guests to begin their presentation. Good uh, afternoon to you all. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak again to this group. I think it's really important for us and the work that we're doing to be able to um, uh, communicate with with this particular um, organization and its members. Quick note um, that this work is supported by the United States National Science Foundation under its Ethical and Responsible Research Program. So thank you so much for them. Uh, we couldn't do this work without that support. Also want to briefly acknowledge <clears throat> some of our other collaborators who are not speaking today, but who have participated in the work we'll be sharing in this talk, Chris Anson, Ian Anson, Suzanne Hall, and Agnes Gamble. I'm going to start out by reading you um, part of an email um, that I got from a colleague <clears throat> in the economics department um, who knew I was working on this issue. Um, and he said, I often find that I need to say the same thing. For example, background about externalities in multiple papers. I will typically copy and paste text from one paper to the next, highlight it, and then before the paper goes out, I go through and massage the text, changing around the order of things, changing the wording, maybe emphasizing something a little more or less. Would that count as self-plagiarism? I've often wondered if I was wasting my time doing that extra manipulation, but it felt odd to just put the same text in multiple documents. At the same time, we do often have to say the same thing and starting from scratch every time feels like a waste too. I think this um, quote captures the tension that a lot of people, particularly in STEM fields, um, feel in, uh, in relation to text recycling. This next slide shows um, what we see as a pretty classic example of text recycling in STEM. Um, these uh, examples are from two of the most prestigious um, outlets, Science and PNAS. You can see at the top um, the precursor paper um, from Science published in 2010. Um, and if you look at that passage, and then you look at the one below from the National Academy of Sciences in 2012, you'll see that the, um, the text is exactly the same except for the small things um, marked in yellow there. So this is a good, I think, mental reference for you to think about when we're talking about text recycling, what's the kind of stuff that we're talking about? A brief note on terminology. Um, prior to about the last five years, um, most people who wrote about this practice used the term self-plagiarism and COPE and us and others have moved towards the term text recycling. The primary reason for that is that obviously plagiarism is an inherently unethical, undesirable thing, but text recycling um, has been shown, as we'll talk about today, to be sometimes inappropriate or unethical and sometimes not so, and to use a term that basically is derogatory in nature requires then some really complicated um, twisting up of language. And um, I've written about this in other places where people have said basically self for plagiarism is plagiarism, but sometimes it's okay to do. Um, and so it seems that using the term text recycling helps us be more clear about the practice. And then we can talk about when it is or is not problematic or inappropriate. It turns out that just defining text recycling is a pretty challenging endeavor. 
Um, I'm going to show you basically kind of where we started and where we are now currently. Um, and if we look at COPE's definition, which is probably the most widely circulated one, um, COPE in conjunction with Biomed Central has probably spent more time working on this issue than any other. Um, and their guidelines uh, for text recycling are among the most widely accessed um, documents. So the current COPE definition says, text recycling occurs when sections of the same text appear, usually unattributed, in more than one of an author's own publications. And as we were working on our own definition, um, we pushed on some of these things, and I'm just going to briefly show you the ways in which um, even this definition is problematic when people need to actually operationalize it. So, for instance, it says that text rec recycling occurs when sections of the text, but as I imagine you know, text recycling rarely happens in complete sections. That is, we really don't see people um, recycling an entire introduction or an entire method section. It's generally um, smaller chunks of text, and we'll show some examples. It also says um, that we're talking about the same text, <clears throat> but we found in our research, not yet published, that actually it's pretty rare for STEM researchers to recycle exactly the same passages verbatim. Instead, what we see is them making small adjustments to make the uh, old text fit the new text. And I'll just show you just a quick example backing up here. You can see in the slide at the top here, this top version has a reference <clears throat> and a sample size. Um, here we have the words or not added. So we'd ask, is that the same text or not the same text? And obviously that's not a trivial thing to, to determine, um, but one we would want to think about. Then the question of what is meant by text, are we talking about just prose? Are we also talking about equations? What about figures or tables or other visuals? Those are also things that we would want to know um, how to deal with. Then there's the matter of uh, attribution in pink there. Um, citation has its own complications. If we define text recycling by the absence of a citation, that is to say, when you reuse your stuff but not citing it, what do we call it when you're reusing it and citing it? And we need terms to be able to talk about the practice in general. Also, it's important to note that a citation doesn't tell readers anything about the presence or absence of text recycling. Authors will usually cite their own prior relevant work, whether or not they're recycling text from those papers. <clears throat> and then when we get to an author's own, um, you can see here, and this is about universally true in guidelines and writing about text recycling, that you can see it's author's singular own, but in fact, very little STEM writing is done single authored. And when we look at material that's recycled, what we see the vast majority of time is not work from the exact same set of authors, but rather from overlapping groups of authors. And so we think it's important that both definitions and policies account for those realistic and common um, variations in authorship. And then finally, publications. While it's true that the most um, contentious issues for text recycling have to do with recycling from one published paper or document to another. People also recycle from non-published materials, things like conference proceedings or dissertations, um, posters, conference talks, grant proposals. And it's also important that authors are aware of when it is or is not appropriate to recycle from those non-published documents. So that leads up to our current definition, which is this. Text recycling is the reuse of textual material, prose, visuals, or equations in a new document where, one, the material in the new document is identical to that of the source or substantively equivalent in both form and content, two, the material is not presented in the new document as a quotation using quotation marks or block indentation. So just to pause there for a second, if an author puts a passage of their own work in quotations, it's then a quotation and not recycled text, according to our definition. And then finally, 
at least one author of the new document is also an author of the prior document. Note that we're not saying anything in this definition about the ethics or legality. We intentionally came up with a definition that does not have implications for when or whether any particular instance of text recycling would be ethical or legal. What we wanted to do was define the, the practice broadly enough to include all cases, and then we can, having a definition, think about when it would or would not be ethical or legal. Certainly the biggest challenge of text recycling is the lack of consistent norms. This is evident in many um, publications from the last uh, 10 years or so. I'll show you here just four titles that I think get to that point. So American Journal Experts has a document called Self-Plagiarism, How to Define It and Why You Should Avoid It. And then Australia's Human Research Ethics Consulting Services, Self-Plagiarism, When Repurposing Text May Be Ethically Justifiable. You can see the tension between those two. In physical therapy, uh, physiotherapy theory and practice, a researcher's ethical dilemma is self plagiarism a condemnable practice or not? And then in the journal Science Editing on difficult in handling text recycling. And when you look at these four examples, they're representative, I think, of a pretty broad confusion about when it is or is not appropriate to reuse material from one's prior work. Now, if we look at the most widely cited and accessed documents, uh, definitely near the top of that list is that of the United States Department of Health and Human Services Office of Research Integrity. If you Google um, self-plagiarism or text recycling, you'll certainly come to this document and it's very widely cited. Um, although that document has been updated over the past 10 years a few times, all of the versions include this passage. Authors are urged to adhere to the spirit of ethical writing and avoid using their own previously published text unless it is done in a manner consistent with standard scholarly conventions, that is, by using quotations and proper paraphrasing. In other words, this says, if you want to be ethical, you should avoid recycling text altogether and instead rewrite it or quote. It's important to note that this widely cited document is actually an essay written by an individual. It was not created by an organization. Uh, it was not um, vetted um, by any organization, and it was not based on research. And just as importantly, if you note at the bottom, um, it's not intended to be used as guidance, right? The italics phrase at the bottom says, right, this module is not intended to be guidance, but in fact, hundreds of organizations, institutions, um, point authors and editors this for the purpose of guidance. If we look at the Biomed Central COPE guidelines, we see something that's very different. So um, this is also uh, one of the most widely referenced and accessed documents. And it says, some degree of text recycling in the background or introduction section of an article may be unavoidable, and it goes on to say that duplication of background ideas may be considered less significant or even considered desirable, contrasted with duplication of the hypothesis, which will only be appropriate in very closely related papers. Um, Cope guidelines say something very similar about method sections. Um, the American Psychological Association's most recent style guide addresses this, and they say there are, however, limited circumstances under which authors may wish to duplicate without attribution or citation their previously used words, feeling that extensive self-referencing is undesirable or awkward. When the duplicated words are limited in the scope, this approach is permissible. So I think this is an interesting example because not only does it say that there are times in which recycling text may be appropriate, there may even be situations which doing it without citation would be desirable. You can see the confusion uh, that the scientific and publishing community would face given these different perspectives on when text recycling is or is not appropriate. The last thing that I want to address here before I turn this over are the alternatives. Many of those who have written about text recycling have suggested basically that text recycling should be a non-issue 
since authors can easily avoid the practice just by quoting themselves or by rewording the material. While this may be true in some situations, STEM authors often do have reason to recycle in situations where no alternative is viable. And let me explain why that's the case. So here are the first two pages from a research article um, that's been run through Authenticate, and you can see the flagged portions. In this case, it's been compared on Authenticate with just one other article. That article was a previous article from the same research group on related paper. So here are the first two pages. And you, I know you can't read the words. What I want you to see here is the pattern, the distribution of recycled material. And then when we get to the section that describes the, the apparatus and setup, you can see a fairly extensive amount of recycling here. And then when we get to results, just some scattered words or phrases. So the point here is, um, for people who would say, you could avoid recycling by quoting, imagine that these authors submitted this paper where all of these red highlighted phrases here or sentences were put in quotations. There's many journals and editors that would not accept that because such extensive use of quotations is both just not normative in scientific writing, but also because quote, quoting is not a neutral practice. It actually draws attention to language. That's the way it's normally used to say, reader, look here. We want you to see that these exact words are being used. In that case, it would be misleading and a distraction. So how about rewording? Well, the editor of a, a major med medical journal said, uh, this was actually from the uh, quote, quote um, online panel they had in developing their guidelines. I've been authenticating all revised papers for several years now, and I'm continually frustrated by self-plagiarism. You'd think that researchers, authors with MDs and PhDs would be bright enough to know how to reword. On the other hand, a linguistics postdoc at a Finnish university whose uh, native language is not English says, if I've spent hours and finally succeeded in writing something the very best way, why would I want to write the same elsewhere the second best way? The other thing to realize then is not what, what is the idea of rewriting, but what actually happens when people are told to rewrite material merely for the sake of avoiding text recycling. So here are three passages um, from one research group on developing a malaria vaccine. And you can see in the left-hand column there, the first two are from the New England Journal of Medicine, 2011, 2012, and the last one from PLOS Medicine, 2014. And look at these three examples. So I've color coded these here, looking at the different phrases. And you can see the top one has the blue phrase and then the gray and then the yellow. And the second one, gray, yellow, blue, the next one, yellow, blue, gray, right? So obviously those rearranges of rearrangements of clauses um, are not serving any communication purpose. They're not improving the communication. In fact, we might say that it's making harder for readers to tell what's the same and what's different. You can also see by the bolded words there, some um, basically changes of words with synonyms that aren't substantive, right? The difference between confidence interval and just CI or vaccine efficiency and VE or for versus resulting in. Even more so, if we look at these three examples, they all contain this sentence. Clinical malaria was defined as an illness accompanied by P. falciparum asexual parasitemia. One paper has greater than symbol 5,000 parasites per cubic millimeter as mm cubed. Another paper at a density of more than 5,000 and then per cubic millimeter written out. And the last one of more than and then per microliter, which is the equivalent of cubic millimeter, right? So what, what I see in this, um, and I haven't spoken to these authors, but the kind of thing where authors are probably trying to avoid recycling text because they either think they should or somebody told them to rewrite it, and you end up getting sometimes things that are probably counterproductive from the point of view of communication. All right, I'm going to turn this over now to Michael um, to tell you about some of our research in this area. Uh, thank you, Carrie. Um, 
one of the things that we wanted to do as a result of some of these preliminary thoughts and discussions we had was to actually go into the trenches, as it were, and to talk to some of the people who were editors or editorial board members uh, on a variety of uh, journals in different fields. In particular, what we wanted to do was to get as diverse a cross-section of uh, editorial experts as we possibly could, and specifically from journals that uh, had pretty high reputations uh, in their various fields. Uh, this is uh, our first look at a survey of gatekeepers across academia. And uh, it demonstrates or shows in this chart the uh, sort of the, the matrix that we used in order to identify journals and uh, or editors and editorial board members. Uh, we targeted 20 journal editors and board members from each of 85 top journals in 15 different academic fields, as well as scholars in our own field of writing studies. Uh, to determine the survey sample that we used, we selected five top English language journals from each of the 15 different fields. Uh, to determine the top journals, we relied on two existing scoring methods. Uh, for the journals in STEM and social science, we selected the top journals as they were ranked by the 2015 eigenfactor scores from the Web of Science's journal citation reports. And for journals in the humanities and the arts, we selected top journals using SciImago's journal rank indicator scores for 2015 as well. Uh, we sent our survey to 1,580 scholars, and we received 316 responses, which is approximately a 20% response rate. The diagram that you're looking at here shows you the various disciplinary clusters of the respondents that we had. Uh, about 40.9% were from the quantitative and qualitative social sciences, 312 were from the humanities, and 21.7% were from STEM disciplines, including natural sciences, engineering, and health sciences, with about 6.3% from other disciplines. Uh, next slide, please. One of the questions that we asked uh, right at the very beginning was, in fact, is text recycling always unacceptable? And this is a, a chart that shows the results. It might be easier to look at these results if we rephrase the question as, is text recycling acceptable in some contexts? And in that case, the green would be representative of yes, it is acceptable, and the orange as no. As you can see here, there are slightly higher percentages in the humanities and the quantitative social sciences uh, that believe that text recycling is unacceptable. And this was sort of a result we didn't really expect, but uh, we were interested in, uh, in finding it, which is that uh, across all areas and all sets of disciplines, about 80 to 90 percent of the respondents believed that text recycling was in fact acceptable in at least some contexts. So even though we entered into this thinking, well, there might be some disciplinary differences and maybe it's less acceptable in some of the STEM fields than it is in others, our results prove that in fact, that was not the case. Uh, next slide, please. One of the questions that we asked the editors and editorial board members uh, was the degree to which an, a text was considered published or accessible. Uh, in terms of whether or not that impacted the ethical uh, acceptability of using text recycling. And you can see here uh, sort of a, a chart that shows that we asked them to respond uh, in terms of could material from this source be used without limits, with some limitations, or that it should not be used at all. And you can see that um, conference posters uh, prove to be the genre that is considered to be the most acceptable to recycle text from, followed by grant proposals, conference papers, internal um, grant reports, external grant reports, and so on. Uh, what this demonstrates to us is that it's the degree to which a, a, a piece of text is taken from a source that's considered published or widely acceptable that in part determines whether or not it's judged to be acceptable or ethical to recycle text. Uh, the genres that are considered to be works in progress or that have relatively small audiences seem to make text recycling more acceptable. For example, um, conference posters, as I said before, generally have relatively small audiences at conferences um, and are generally considered to be displays of works in progress. 
uh, a framework for a future article, for example, rather than a completed work. Um, one thing we would like to point out here, though, is the category of conference present or conference proceedings, because the publication status of proceedings often varies by field and likely impacted people's responses about whether or not it was acceptable to recycle text. Uh, for some disciplines, proceedings are considered the final venues for publication. Um, and even, I would point out here, even for when the source is a journal article, nearly half of the people that we surveyed or got responses from indicated that they were okay with at least a limited amount of text recycling. Uh, next slide, please. We also asked about the structure or location, where this recycling appeared in both the source and destination texts. And in many fields, such as STEM and social sciences, uh, scholarly writing is typically organized into standard named sections, many of which you undoubtedly recognize, uh, introduction, methods, results, discussion. Uh, in other fields, such as in the humanities and some social science areas, the structure is flexible and only implicitly suggested. Uh, these differences made it difficult and challenging for us to design questions about structure for the, device, uh, the diverse populations that we studied, but we nevertheless asked whether it was acceptable to recycle material from various sections of a journal article, and we allowed people to give a not applicable response if it did not exactly fit the conventions, the genre conventions or discourse conventions of their field. Um, not surprisingly, the respondents were most accepting of recycling in methods section, and this is in the middle bar, as you can see. Uh, and this aligns, aligns with other studies as well as with major published guidelines. Um, only about 20% of respondents felt recycling in methods was inherently unacceptable. Um, and recycling from introductions and abstracts were also fairly well accepted. Um, and again, this is in alignment with existing studies and discourse on the topic. Uh, and while the responses were more restrictive in results and discussion sections, we would note that uh, approximately a third of the respondents were okay with a limited amount of recycling, even in those sections. Next slide, please. Uh, we also asked about authorship, and this is the last uh, slide that I'll show you about this survey that we conducted, although there were many other results that are in the publication that we have uh, that was listed on the first slide in my part of the presentation. Uh, but we're going to talk just a little bit about authorship, which is, uh, as Carrie alluded to, a frustratingly complex matter when it comes to text recycling. Uh, there are lots of factors that could matter to scholars about whether or not a specific instance of recycling would be acceptable. For instance, whether some or all authors of the new text were also authors of the source, whether they had permission to do so, or whether or not the source and the new text were the output of a formal research group. So even though these factors are not mutually exclusive, investigating them would require an extensive matrix of questions which we weren't prepared to do at this time, but we did ask about a number of these factors, knowing that the results could at least give us a sense of how much they might matter. Uh, the chart itself here um, is uh, uh, sort of slightly truncated, so I'll just read through uh, the definitions on each one of these categories. Uh, the first is uh, about whether or not the source and the new text have the same authors in common. Uh, the second one, the source and the new text share at least one author, but the other contributors gave permission to have recycled text. Uh, number three, as above, but others have not given permission. Number four, all authors of the new text work in the re same research project group, and one or more are authors of the same text as uh, of the source text as well. And as above, none were authors of the source text uh, in the destination text. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time describing this, but I will point out a couple of things. Uh, first of all, if you look at the top bar, this is essentially equivalent to solo authored work. In other words, the same authors, the authors are exactly the same in the source document and the destination document. And nearly all of the respondents were okay with recycling and a small percentage didn't know. Uh, the very bottom bar, if you take a look at it, uh, in which no authors of the new text were authors of the source, uh, the context becomes difficult to separate contextually from plagiarism, 
And not surprising, the majority of respondents did not find that kind of recycling acceptable. But there's an interesting contrast between numbers three and four. Um, in number three, a significant majority of people seem to indicate that all authors of a source text must give permission for that text to be recycled in a new work. But on the other hand, if you have a research group that's working on a single project with multiple facets and that produces publications that have overlapping but not identical authors necessarily, our respondents were more or less equally divided among those who said this practice was acceptable, those who said it was unacceptable, and those who admitted they just didn't know. Uh, next slide. Um, the second uh, study that we did in terms of exploring the beliefs and attitudes of uh, journal editors and other editors and editorial board members had to do with a series of um, interviews that we conducted. In our initial survey, we asked respondents if they'd be willing to be interviewed regarding their beliefs about text recycling, and we used those to identify a preliminary pool of candidates to get in contact uh, and to explore some of these issues in more depth and detail than we were able to in the survey. Um, the protocol that we used, well, I'll, I'll start first of all with just, um, we talked with 21 editors and editors in chief, seven of whom were housed in STEM fields, seven in the humanities and seven in the social sciences. Our protocol began with a simple definition of text recycling, um, as Carrie showed you. And we began by asking them about their personal experiences as writers or as authors with text recycling. Had they ever considered doing it? Had they done it themselves? We followed up by asking them about their experiences as editors, um, thinking that in fact, there might be some differences between their personal points of view about the acceptability of text recycling and their professional points of view in their professional role as editors. Uh, we then presented them with a scenario in which a manuscript made an original contribution, um, but included some text recycling from an earlier publication. We asked the editors uh, how the source of the text recycling, its quantity, its location, and authorship would affect how they would hand handle the matter at their journal. And then lastly, they were asked about how their understanding of copyright and disciplinary citation practices might have shaped their position. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a quick snapshot of a portion of the coding scheme that we developed in order to um, analyze these transcripts. Uh, we began by creating transcript summaries to identify what we saw as key opinions or rationales, or in some cases, tensions and contradictions, even from the same editor. Uh, we used these points to create a basic framework for analysis and then developed a much more detailed and nuanced coding scheme as we worked through the individual transcripts. Uh, overall, in the transcripts that we collected, we had 1,866 individual coded transcript sections across 198 different categories and subcategories and many of those passages contained multiple codes. Uh, this shows you a small subset, again, of the categories, the, in particular the ones that focused on what seemed to be the principles and rationales that editors used in order to either justify a certain instance of text recycling or to condemn the practice overall. Um, this next slide is a portion of a word cloud that shows the frequency with which some of the individual codes appeared in the transcripts. Uh, this isn't always an indication of the number of editors who commented on the matters, because as you can see with the topic of originality and new contribution and citation, um, all text recycling should be cited or quoted. Some of the editors that we interviewed came back to these points repeatedly during their discussions with us. Next slide. Um, and then lastly, what I'm going to do is just give a quick overview of some of the initial findings that emerged from the um, both the survey as well as the interviews that we conducted with editors. Uh, one of the most important findings has to do with this question of originality. Um, most editors and others seem to find that it was a vitally important consideration when making judgments about the ethics of text recycling. But part of the problem was is that those definitions sometimes varied. 
Uh, sometimes originality was defined to mean that the work must overall make an original contribution to disciplinary knowledge. But sometimes it was interpreted to mean that every sentence in a published text had to be original to that text. Um, in some cases, people, authors made a, a distinction between what they saw as the functional apparatus of a text, such as the introduction or the methods or a literature review, and the sections of the text, such as discussion and results, that presented what they saw as original findings. Um, in terms of rewriting text, uh, if you want to look at it in a positive way, some people, some editors said, uh, rewriting text can actually serve a generative function. It makes the work fresh for the author. Uh, in a somewhat less positive spin, uh, it was clear to us that quite a number of editors were seriously apprehensive about allowing text recycling, mostly because of the potential for negative perceptions in their disciplinary communities. Uh, they wanted to avoid the perception that they were endorsing recycled work. It had impact on professional reputations, not only for the journal, but also for the authors themselves. Uh, they were looking for ways to avoid accusations of self-plagiarism or getting flagged by Authenticate or possibly violating copyright. Um, with circulation and accessibility, some clear-cut cases appeared with books, chapters, and journal articles, which were easily recognized as being official publications. But in some cases, there were um, disputes about what was considered to be a publication. Uh, was a conference presentation a publication? Some people thought so. Proceedings we already talked about, that different disciplines have different concepts about whether or not a proceeding is a publication. Uh, but it also extended into areas like blog posts, or posters, or even materials that were prepared to apply for or report on grants. With the issue of copyright, and David is going to be talking about this more extensively, uh, many of the editors we spoke with expressed a fear of violating copyright, but they did not appear particularly well versed in copyright law or the extent to which fair use might impact text recycling. And then lastly, as I alluded to at the beginning of my portion of the talk here, uh, we were looking into whether or not people's personal opinions about text recycling um, aligned with or varied with their professional perspectives. A number of the editors that we uh, met with uh, discussed how they had, uh, re they recounted stories asking colleagues why self-plagiarism or text recycling was unethical, and they didn't feel that they got satisfactory answers. Um, they talked about how they had engaged in text recycling in their own writing, but in many cases were stricter as editors than they thought was really merited or necessary. Uh, and they also observed, and I think that this is somewhat telling, that they sometimes gave advice to graduate students to avoid text recycling that they didn't fully believe in themselves. And with that, uh, I will thank you and I will turn it over to David. Thanks. Uh, so I'm going to talk now about the legal dimensions of text recycling. Um, this is a significant part of the project because um, in, in a lot of areas, law and ethics are tightly intertwined together. Um, and as we began this project, it was very clear that um, particularly when it comes to uh, issues uh, surrounding certainly plagiarism, but text recycling as well, um, disentangling uh, the, the um, ethical situations from the legal situations uh, becomes really important because sometimes uh, th there's this sort of loop that goes between those people saying, ah, I believe that this thing is illegal um, under some statute or some legal regime and therefore it's unethical. And so we really wanted to shed some light on um, whether that is actually the case. Um, and uh, our research has um, focused on two things here. Uh, one is uh, really focusing in on copyright law aspects of um, reuse of, of uh, creative works. And then the other piece of this that I'll talk uh, a little bit less about is um, contract law. Uh, and those two are also intertwined. Um, so at the outset, I do want to say our research is currently focused on US law. Um, part of that is we're, we're a U.S.-based team, um, and uh, I'm a U.S.-based lawyer, and so that's what I know um, and uh, have focused in on here. Um, and uh, that's not to say that 
um, what I'm going to cover here is totally inapplicable to um, text recycling in other jurisdictions, but uh, anytime you look at legal regimes, it's really important to appreciate that um, where you are and where the use happens matters a lot. Um, and uh, particularly when it comes to copyright law issues, although um, laws across the world are um, harmonized in, in some big picture ways, um, when it comes down to questions about specific types of use, uh, you really do have to look at the specific laws that are applicable um, within the jurisdiction that you are uh, making the use. So, so we're focusing on US law. Um, I will say though that around this, most jurisdictions have, um, have some rights that look very, uh, uh, rights and uh, on, on the author side, but also rights on the user side that are um, somewhat similar in terms of allowing people to make, for example, uses um, for uh, quotation purposes, which is one of the most uh, relevant kinds of uses here. Um, there are also some important uh, uh, distinctions so, um, so this, this slide here provides some examples of the ways that these uh, statutes are similar to each other, right? So copyright uh, uh, quoted at the top here is US section 201 of the Copyright Act um, provides initially protection belongs to the author. Um, the EU InfoSoc Directive talks about um, authors being the initial holders of rights. This is the international norm is that a lot of copyright is focused around authors um, being the initial um, holder of rights. There are some important uh, distinctions in terms of how uh, different jurisdictions frame their copyright laws. So for example, in the United States, um, our copyright law is a very utilitarian type of law. Uh, the US Constitution sets out the purpose for copyright. It says that it is for the purpose of promoting the progress of science and the useful arts. And, and it's with that purpose in mind that Congress is allowed to create a statute that gives exclusive rights to authors. That's actually pretty different from um, the rationale for giving copyright rights to authors in other jurisdictions. Um, in, uh, for example, in France or in several other uh, European jurisdictions, the motivation for creating copyright is really to protect the, the rights that are thought to be inherent in an act of authorship. Uh, it's a very like natural rights kind of theory of um, uh, of a legal regime there. And so uh, that actually works its way out in a couple of really distinct ways when we start to look at US copyright law, um, and particularly when we get to the analysis of whether uh, the doctrine of fair use applies. But I want to start here with this authorship slide because this is really critical. You might be thinking, you know, what are the, really the copyright implications uh, of reusing your own work? Um, every single jurisdiction around the world starts off with this assumption that if you are the author, you own the rights in those works. Um, and so uh, it's important to kind of logically step through how these rights are transferred between authors and publishers and how that then creates some challenges when it comes to authors wanting to reuse some of their own work um, in a text recycling scenario. Um, so, uh, uh, Carrie, next slide, please. Um, so typically what happens is authors, authorship um, means that the author holds the initial set of rights, but um, in the vast majority of uh, publishing arrangements, right? So an author writes an article um, and sends that off to a publisher. I just copied the standard terms of a uh, Elsevier contract here. Um, the author gives almost all of those rights away. Uh, so this is a typical contract term saying the author assigns to the copyright owner, the copyright in the manuscript, um, and uh, that includes exclusive rights, the exclusive right to control aspects of publication and reproduction, um, and you can see this covers in all sorts of media in any form. These are very, very broad grants of rights. So I do want to say, um, you know, there are some uh, other models for um, uh, publication contracts, particularly with open access publications where authors retain more of the rights themselves. Um, and that uh, minimizes some of the copyright questions that come up about whether an author can reuse his or her own work. Um, but for our purposes, we, we really wanted to look at this situation where the author has transferred the vast majority of the rights over to a publisher, because that's representative of um, most of what is happening right now in scholarly publishing, in STEM publishing. Um, 
granted that we know that that um, stream of open access publishing uh, with author retained rights is uh, is a growing area. Um, so if you have a situation where you're the author and um, you have transferred rights over to the publisher, um, and then you're looking at reusing some of your own work in a subsequent publication, uh, you have to start asking some questions about whether that uh, reuse is acceptable under copyright law and looking specifically under US law, um, you wanna start looking at things like, do I have permission to do this, which is a contract question that we'll get to in a moment, or does the law as a default matter allow me to do this because there's some provision, some exception to those copyright rights that allows me to do this anyways. So in the US, uh, we have this doctrine of fair use. Um, Fair use has some rough analogs in other jurisdictions, sometimes referred to as fair dealing um, in a slightly different way uh, in some other jurisdictions. Um, what fair use is in the US is not a specific prescription on um, allowing you to use, uh, for example, um, you know, 30 seconds of a clip or, or you know, a certain number of words from a manuscript. Uh, what it is is a flexible exception to copyright law where courts look at these factors and really are trying to balance them um, in light of the overall purpose of copyright, which again is to incentivize new creative works. Um, so I'm just gonna talk through these really quickly to give you a sense of how we believe fair use works its way out in, um, in a texture-like text recycling scenario um, under US law. So just one example here is imagine reusing a, a methods section of a paper. Um, well, you work through these factors, right? Purpose and character of the use. That often is looking at, like, is your use scholarly? Um, is it for a commercial purpose? Uh, scholarly tends to weigh more in favor of use. Um, is the use transformative, meaning you're using that content for a new, with a new meaning or a different purpose or message? Um, you could see with uh, reuse of a methods section, um, there may be some argument there that actually you're using it for a, uh, for a different purpose. Um, from whatever it was used for in the original manuscript. Um, it's, it's to um, frame an issue in a subsequent paper in a much different way, um, but communicating uh, that you used uh, an identical um, method to uh, a previous study. Um, nature of the work looks at things like whether the, the um, work is highly factual or whether it was highly creative. Again, thinking about um, the purpose of US copyright laws to incentivize uh, creation of um, new creative works. And this is where um, reuse of things like a methods section uh, would weigh particularly uh, in favor of fair use because methods sections are, uh, there, there are some aspects of methods sections that are um, potentially not protectable at all. Copyright has, uh, US copyright um, excludes protection of systems and methods of operation. And uh, so, so that factor and that uh, would, would tend to um, weigh in favor of the use. Um, amount and substantiality, this is where courts look at both the amount of, of material that you're using. A lot of people get kind of tripped up and, you know, again, you know, a thousand words or a couple chapters. Um, but really what the courts are looking at here is, did you use more than was necessary to accomplish um, an acceptable purpose uh, under that first factor? And so, you, know, you may look at a uh, reuse of a method section and say, well, if your intent was to communicate that you followed the exact same process in the subsequent paper as you did in the previous paper, then you would necessarily want to use the whole thing or at least most of it so that you're saying the same terms and you're not introducing any confusion about differences between the methods in paper A and paper B. Um, and then the fourth factor is the effect of uh, the use on the market for the original. Um, a couple different ways to look at this, but one is, um, are you harming uh, the market for that original paper, right? So is anybody going to say, well, gee, I, I could have read paper A, um, but I found the subsequent paper that included a lot of the same content, so I'll just read that. Um, in all the scenarios that we've talked about, uh, or that, that we have uh, kind of proposed in thinking through these uh, copyright issues, we're assuming that these papers are intellectually distinct papers that have different underlying findings. Um, and if that is the case, then really there should be very little effect on um, the market for the original. So um, 
that's a quick rundown through the fair use factors and how uh, you would analyze those in the case of, for example, a use that involves a, a reuse of a method section. Um, this is just an illustration really to help uh, uh, show some of the, uh, the flow of information from previously published to uh, the article that you are now um, working on. Uh, and one, um, one of the challenges that you'll see if you think about this is um, you end up having uh, both the copyright question, but then multiple contract questions that come up in here. Um, and this is because we have um, contracts both in governing both the use of the content from the, uh, the sending journal as well as the receiving journal. So from the first paper and the second paper are potentially covered by two separate contracts. So this is the second part of what we really wanted to dig deep on is what does contract law say about um, reuse of material for text recycling? Um, we've done quite a bit of work on pulling apart um, contracts uh, from several of the major uh, publishers. Um, and just some high level findings are, um, number one, they vary uh, really widely in the kind of information that they provide about text recycling. Um, I would say the vast majority don't speak to it in any explicit way at all. Um, it's also pretty inconsistent where that information is located when there is something in the contract. Um, contracts are, are uh, as I'm sure you all know, not the easiest thing to read. Um, even publishing contracts that try to keep themselves to one or two pages, it's often hard to find this information in there. Um, and then uh, where they really vary is in what they actually allow in terms of reuse and what they say about, for example, um, authors continued availability to use uh, the doctrine of fair use. Um, so uh, just to give you a couple of examples uh, to think about here, um, this is an example of a uh, of a contract from New England Journal of Medi Medicine, um, and it talks about uh, authors' ability to reuse their own contributions. Um, and so it has a contractual prohibition here. It says authors may not use or authorize use of their contribution without the society's written consent. Um, except it does allow them to have access to these U.S. Fair, uh, uh, rights under U.S. fair use. Um, and so uh, you can see with a contract term like this, this doesn't, it doesn't provide authors much clarity, um, uh, but it does allow them a sort of safety valve or a relief valve to say, okay, well, if I really think about that fair use analysis, maybe I'm going to be okay for reuse of some portions of my paper in a subsequent uh, publication, but it's not explicit at all. You can see if you're reading this and not thinking about it through the lens of how text recycling interacts with copyright law, you would totally miss that this uh, would have any applicability to that type of use. Um, we know from some of our research that uh, the vast majority of editors and authors um, uh, don't um, really get into or, or have a great appreciation for how fair use applies. Um, so that's another challenge with a clause like that, um, where it allows for uh, a fair use, is that it, it doesn't it doesn't give um, authors or editors much guidance if it's saying go look at this uh, provision of the law that um, most research indicates that you don't have a clue what it means or or at least aren't comfortable with applying it um, in situations like this. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so one of the other challenges is that um, some publications have uh, grant authors rights that are even less than fair use. Um, and so although I just ran through that fair use analysis for you, and my conclusion from that is that actually in some circumstances under copyright law, it, it's perfectly fine as a fair use for an author to reuse his or her own materials. Some contracts may preclude uh, authors from doing that anyways because they have specific limitations. So this one from ACS uh, has a specific limitation on saying um, that you can reuse only uh, text extracts of up to 400 words um, in subsequent scholarly publications. So uh, that can also be a major limitation that isn't really reflective of the underlying copyright law. It's just a kind of policy decision that's baked into the um, contract here. And so it also doesn't clear up um, other types of reuses. So for example, well, how many graphs or tables are allowed? 
Um, and uh, it also leaves some, some questions about, well, how many extracts? Is it one extract of 400 words or more? So the um, point is contracts do address these sorts of issues, but they don't address them very clearly or um, uh, directly. Um, so next, and this will be my uh, last here. Um, so this is addressing, um, and ACS is interesting because they address both uh, the situation on the previous slide, which was um, a situation where you're taking an article that was published with ACS and using it in some subsequent publication. Um, the ACS contract also governs use of previously published material, um, and, and many journals do this, but um, it talks about what sort of parameters are acceptable for ACS. Um, and what's interesting here is ACS basically writes out fair use um, in this situation. So they say if the submitted work includes material that was previously published in a non-ACS journal, um, even whether the author participated in the earlier publication doesn't matter, they still require the copyright holder's permission. Um, and what's so interesting about that is um, under the default rules of US copyright law, the whole point of fair use is that you don't have to go obtain permission. You don't have to get someone to sign off. Um, it's just a, uh, an exception that's already part of the law. It's, it's baked into the set of rights and limitations on rights that the uh, law permits. So in this situation, if you're using something from a subsequent publication, even if it's fair use, that doesn't matter to ACS. They require authors to go get a sign off on that anyways. All right, thank you, David. Um, I know we're running tight on time here, so I'm just gonna give a very quick um, wrap up. Um, we're currently starting phase two of our project. Um, we're in the process of starting now, developing new model guidelines, policy statements, um, contract language um, that we hope will be useful for the uh, STEM community. And then in the next phase, we'll be working on developing educational materials. Um, and existing guidelines like those as COPE are a good first step. COPEs actually were a major contribution to a world in which almost nothing authoritative was available on the topic. Um, but we found that authors and editors would benefit from more explicit guidance. And it's worth noting that COPE's guidelines actually are only for editors um, and that there's nothing really widely available um, for authors. And we think that authors and editors would both benefit from standardized approach to text recycling, both in substance and how and where information on text recycling is provided for authors so people would actually know where to go look for it. Um, Authenticate and similar softwares um, were not developed to handle text recycling, and we should be careful about setting thoughtful policies about how those are used. Ultimately, the code should not determine policy. Attempts by publishers to protect themselves by requiring authors to obtain permissions for recycled material deprives authors of the ability to practice under fair use and may actually erode the application of fair use. And finally, text recycling is complex and multifaceted. There's a broad consensus that text recycling is sometimes appropriate, less clear about when. Existing guidelines are contradictory, often unclear, and usually not research-based. And Typical text recycling and scientific writing does not violate US copyright law, but contracts might extend or limit what authors can do. In the process of developing our guidelines, we're currently having conversations and interviews with representatives from stakeholder groups, including COPE, PLOS, American Chemical Society, American Society of Civil Engineers, Council of Scientific Editors, and the NIH. Um, we hope to have um, materials available um, for guidelines, hopefully by next summer. If you're interested in seeing our publications or learning more about the project, um, you can access full text versions of all our publications here, um, as well as other information. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. I'm afraid we only have about 10 minutes for uh, questions. I'll be reading out your questions. Uh, and I apologize in advance if we can't get to everybody's question. First question is, for recycling of materials and methods, can you comment on the possibility of posting this type of material, this type of material to pr platforms like protocols and then linking to this protocol in published articles? Could you comment on this practice and how this may or may not adhere 
to the types of policies you looked at? Uh, sure, I'll just make a brief comment on that and see if my colleagues have answers. Um, we do know that some editors um, like the idea, at least in some situations, of um, avoiding large amounts of recycling and methods by having authors summarize those methods and then referring readers elsewhere. But we also talked to editors that said they feel it's important for their um, manuscripts to be self-contained and they did not want to refer to readers elsewhere. Sometimes those concerns about having the ref reference document being behind a paywall, which obviously isn't the case um, in this particular situation, I think it's certainly something to consider, but that would require really editors making some kind of and publishers uniform decisions of the kind that they haven't done yet. Um, Michael or David, anything to add to that? Well, I mean, I think that one of the things that a lot of people might be interested in is sharing protocols and databases and data collection information that was key to helping to develop uh, a number of these articles or publications. And I think that, you know, I mean, in some cases that could be useful, but in other cases, there might be issues having to do with obviously data confidentiality and the like. Uh, as uh, David was saying in his part of the presentation, there's a pretty wide variance in terms of what sorts of things are contractually um, uh, dictated about the kinds of material that can be showed and, and the kinds that can't. I'll just add an interesting spin on that because uh, I work with um, researchers who are often looking at putting things in those places and one strategy that they uh, I've seen some folks do is actually to pre-publication um, put material in some other locations like that um, with a license term already attached to it that they are okay with um, and then uh, they're free to then use that in you know the first publication and subsequent ones and they've kind of uh, used uh, the method of posting it to something like that as a uh, as a means of getting the licensing term that they want rather than having it all be covered by their journal publishing agreement. Okay, second question. In your survey, did you look at any differences between open access and subscription journals? Do you have any thoughts or data about how this may affect the opinions about or prevalence of text recycling? We did not get to that particular issue in our survey at all. Um, my sense is that we probably can't speak to that empirically. Um, I don't know if either of my colleagues have any thoughts. Well, I think that we were limited to some extent by the fact that we use the Sci Imago ratings as well as um, uh, the eigenfactor scores, which I think were probably predominantly, if not exclusively focused on print journals in each of these areas. So in that regard, uh, it's unlikely that we would have uh, contacted or interviewed editors who were um, working in open access journals. Okay, the third question. You mentioned the legal versus ethical standards about te text recycling. So this sounds like it's for David. Uh, can you comment about some of the possible ethical implications of text recycling for example, misrepresenting novelty to a reader and how and if and how or how uh, that may factor into the legal aspects. Sure. Um, so I talked about the two main parts of this research that we've covered so far, which are copyright law and contract law. Um, one of the other parts of this that we have started on is like, what are the other legal regimes that maybe uh, have some applicability here? Um, and, and there are some where you could see, uh, for example, a claim around um, false light or, or you know, even a defamation claim rising from um, someone or, or a um, unfair and deceptive trade practice claim uh, deriving from someone uh, making a um, intentionally misleading claim. However, um, I, I guess I should say two things. One is uh, plagiarism and self-plagiarism or text recycling. Um, is not something for which there's any kind of independent legal cause of action. So you can't, uh, at least in the US and in most jurisdictions, for example, uh, sue someone for plagiarism. Um, you can sue someone for copyright infringement. You can sue them for a, a variety of other claims. But in the preliminary work that we've done on that, uh, it seems pretty unlikely um, that you'd be able to make out a realistic 
um, legal claim for any of those other um, causes of action, except in some highly unusual circumstances. Uh, one exception to that is um, when there's research funding involved and uh, there are specific regulations governing reuse of material um, under, uh, for example, NSF rules. Uh, and there could be some specific claim there that's not based in copyright, but based on just the federal regulations governing research. And I'll just add to the question, if I understood that part of it, um, about potential deception and whether or not readers would be misled by text recycling because they were expecting new stuff and some of it was was reused. Um, that even, even though some people have made the argument that there's this thing called a reader-writer contract and that universally, if there's a new work, readers expect every part of it to be new, there really is no such universal contract. It's very um, much determined by the norms of the discipline and the genre. And I would say, for instance, particularly in um, empirical, experimental STEM work, um, text recycling has probably been done um, uh, on large, not, not necessarily large scales of it, but pretty continuously. And I think, you know, in our own work that we're seeing that people oftentimes expect, oh, you're doing a follow-up study of this previous study and you've used some of the same methods, they would not be surprised that re you reused the exact same methods. So uh, I think it's just important that people realize that there isn't any kind of universal expectation that any new document has ex exclusively new textual materials. Um, it really depends on what the norms are in each discipline. Okay, I think we probably only have time for one or two more questions. Uh, what criteria were used to differentiate conference papers and conference proceedings in the survey? Um, I can speak to that. Uh, I uh, We provided all of the people that we were surveying with, uh, uh, oh, excuse me, I'm thinking about a different study. Um, we, I think that in the original survey, we made a distinction uh, between the two, mostly by referring to it as conference presentations um, rather than conference papers. Uh, in the handout and the material that we gave to the editors when we were doing the follow-up interviews, we um, uh, provided a number of samples of different kinds of source materials and places where text could be recycled from and to. And in the handouts that we included in those uh, uh, packets of information, there were always juxtaposed conference proceedings and either conference presentation or conference paper. So we tried to make it relatively clear to the people who were responding to our questions, both in the survey and in the follow-up interviews, that we were making a distinction between the two of them. I, I think it's also important, though, to realize that the nature of this question points to kind of difficulties of names of genres in forming, forming policies, right? So we might say conference proceedings is a thing. But as Michael alluded to, um, if you're in engineering, a conference proceedings is almost always a pre-publication, and many journals explicitly invite authors who have had works in conference proceedings to submit some version of that as a full-fledged journal article. And in those cases, they actually expect much of that work to be recycled. On the other hand, in fields such as computer science, a conference proceedings is really the equivalent of a journal article. So even the word conference proceedings um, is a tricky thing to deal with in terms of establishing norms and policies for text recycling because it depends on which discipline considers it as the ultimate finished, right, the, the final publication versus something that's not yet the last stage. Okay, we have uh, about two minutes, so what, one more question and then we have to wrap up. The beginning of the presentation was about policies from different publishers or other groups. Have you seen many updates of these policies over time? And can you comment on any trends and the changes in these policies? Uh, excellent question to end on. <clears throat> so I would say um, there have been increasing numbers of, of institutions, organizations that have been adding policies over the last decade. Um, in terms of updating them, I've seen some of those. 
Um, maybe the most notable one is uh, our U.S. Um, ORI, that um, essay by Miguel Roig, who over the past 10 years has edited and revised that piece, becoming gradually more accommodating to text recycling. The early versions basically said, you should never do it, it's unethical. And later versions said, well, when you're using methods, there are times when it's probably appropriate to do, et cetera. Um, but by and large, um, and I think interestingly, much as of the what's been written to establish norms for text recycling has not been formally through policies per se, but in editorials. And what we found for editorials, of which there have been literally dozens, if not into the hundreds, across uh, various STEM journals <clears throat> in the past uh, five years or so, is that those are almost always the independent opinions of a single editor or a group of editors. But again, I've seen almost none that have been based on any kind of formal empirical rationale. Um, they oftentimes refer back to either the COPE guidelines or the ORI document. Um, and that's really understandable because really until the text recycling project, our work started, there's been almost no empirical um, or the kind of theoretical foundational work to build on, which is really what made us start this project in the first place. Okay, we're out of time, so I can only briefly thank Michael and Carrie and David for their presentation. Thank you for attending. Uh, I'm sorry if we didn't get to your question. We will be uh, posting the edited proceedings of this engagement, edited uh, presentation and comments and questions, and you can definitely uh, give us feedback um to that if you can't uh if you didn't get through that or you have other um at the at the end of this you have other ideas and other comments and other questions so thank you very much for attending thank you to our speakers and have a good rest of the day or night depending on where you are <laughs>